Okay, welcome to Little Steps Asia's virtual school panel for Hong Kong. My name is Natasha and I lead the regional educational partnerships at Little Steps Asia. Just a few quick friendly reminders before we begin. Um, we do actually go live every two weeks on Facebook. So if you would like a reminder of any of our upcoming events, then please go to our Facebook page and click onto the event section and you'll get a reminder sent to your phone. Second of all, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out across all our regions covering Hong Kong, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta and beyond. These are jam packed full of lots of information, very useful to keep you in the know and on the go. So please do sign up. Um, and lastly, we are live at the moment. So if you've got any questions for us, then please do send, send them our way. We will be happy to answer those for you. Um, and so today we will be exploring early years education and getting to know some of the key educators at our top Hong Kong schools. We usually classify early years up to five years old, and it's a foundation for a child's future developing, uh, develop, development, sorry, for a child's future development, providing a strong base for lifelong learning. Little Steps is very happy to introduce our panel today. We have teachers from Hong Kong Academy, Malvin College, Nord Angli International School, and uh, Wickham Abbey. Welcome everybody. Hello. Hello, welcome. Oh, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so firstly, I'd like to start with Virginia Hunt. Um, Virginia is from Hong Kong Academy. Virginia, please could you give us a brief introduction about yourself and your school, please? Sure, happy to. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Virginia Hunt, I'm the primary school principal, and I'm very proud to be part of the Hong Kong Academy community for the past 14 years as both an educator and a parent, as both my children have come through the school. Hong Kong Academy is situated in the beautiful town of Sai Kong. We're a nonprofit IB World School offering a highly personalized holistic education for students ages two to 18 years old. We pride ourselves on offering a wealth of learning experiences, which empower students to reach their full potential and discover their passions. We're now in our 20th year and our programs are designed to balance the needs of students today whilst preparing them to reimagine the world of the future. Thank you, Virginia. Um, now moving on to Jacqueline McNulty from Malvin College Preschools. Um, I hope I pronounced your last name there correctly, Jacqueline, but please, you do. <laughs> please can we have a brief introduction uh, about yourself and your school, please. So welcome everybody. It's a delight to be here today. My name is Jacqueline McNulty and I'm the founding principal for Melvin College Preschools. We put an S at the end because we have two wonderful campuses in Hong Kong. So I've got, I come to Hong Kong with 28 years leadership experience. I've worked and opened schools in Australia, London, China, Singapore, and now I enter my fourth year in Hong Kong. I joined and worked with the Melbourne College Preschool team in 2016 when I was leading in Singapore, and we formally opened our first preschool in Coronation Circle in Kowloon in 2017. And again, very excited to be here in Hong Kong in my fourth year. I have two crazy sons that are also uh, keep me busy and attend our big sister school, which opened in 2018 out in Taipo. The preschool that I lead and I oversee, we've got two beautiful campuses, 8,000 square feet. Again, one at Coronation Circle Kowloon and the newest baby in the family is at Hong Kong uh, Island West on Hong Kong Island. Both our campuses are very special and unique. We are, follow the EYFS or Early Years Foundation Stage Curriculum. We're very unique in that we deliver that program in a bilingual approach. So 50% English and 50% Mandarin. We're inspired by the Reggio Emilia design and ethos. So our preschools are absolutely beautiful. And we are also very, very special and unique. <laughs> We're the only school in Hong Kong to offer a forest beach school program. So that's a little bit about us and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more about our other unique and lovely schools. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, and then moving on to Ruth Hansen from North Anglia International School. Ruth, could you give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and your school, please? 
I will. Thank you very much. I'm Ruth Hansen, Head of Campus at Tai Tam School. I, we work at Nord Anglia International School, Hong Kong. Uh, we have two preschools and one uh, primary and secondary campus. This is my third year in Hong Kong. Prior to that, I was in Shanghai with Nord Anglia for six years. And before that, I was working in London at a children's centre and also at Great Ormond Street Hospital as an early years consultant. So lots of years of experience, um, but you're always learning, always learning something new. Um, um, and it's just a real privilege to be part of the early years um, education team and Nord Anglia. Nord Anglia is a global company with 66 schools um, and it's just a real privilege to work with children in, in Nord Anglia in Hong Kong. So that's me. Thank you Ruth, fantastic. And then lastly moving on to Howard Tuckett from Wickham Abbey. Hi, hi Howard. Um, hi, hi, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome from me and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining in with us. So yes, I'm Howard Tuckett. I'm the uh, founding head of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. Uh, I guess we're the odd one out this afternoon because we're the only school here that doesn't uh, have an early years facility. Our youngest children are the equivalent of UK year one. So they're five plus. Uh, but of course that gives us a great interest in early years because everybody who joins us uh, comes from a different, one of the many wonderful early years facilities in Hong Kong and probably half of my job is uh, building contacts uh, with early year schools. In fact, I, I've just come back from one this morning. Um, so of course, my year one and year two teachers are all early years trained, although they are key stage one teachers uh, in, in this format. Uh, so Wickham Abbey is famously a girls uh, boarding school in the United Kingdom, very old school, very high achieving academic school. Uh, Wickham Abbey International, the company that stems from that, is a co-educational uh, three to, to 18 uh, different schools in the company offer different ranges. But in Hong Kong at the moment, we are just the primary school. We start at five, we currently run to 11. Um, and because we bring to Hong Kong the British prep school model, um, we are, will be developing up to 13, uh, particularly for those children in Hong Kong who are waiting to go off to boarding school in the United States or the United Kingdom. Uh, we can offer them that bridging uh, until the, it's time to go off to their boarding schools. And because we're a British prep school in Hong Kong, our whole curriculum, uh, which is the national curriculum for England and Wales, which has been uh, blended with the uh, Hong Kong EDB primary curriculum for local cultural relevance and the British common entrance curriculum for the older years, which is really just an enriched version of the English, the, the national curriculum for England and Wales. Uh, we are preparing children for their secondary education, uh, moving them from their early years through the primary phase, preparing them for secondary education. And if international boarding is something that the family are interested in, we're already geared for that. And I advise parents on uh, those schools without them needing to go to separate agents or tutors or anything like that. Brilliant. Thank you, Howard. Great to find out a lot more about your school there. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody. Um, so it's great to meet you. Um, let's get started with our panel. Um, to start off with, I'd like to talk about cultural and school insights. Um, could we start off with describing the culture of your school in five words or less? Um, so Howard, let's go back to you. How would you describe Wickham Abbey in five words? It's a, fr it's a very friendly school. Um, I, I think, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I can't do it in five words. I'll try and keep it down to 10. Um, Hello, Howard. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, fr friendly, holistic education. There we are, four words. That's four. Okay. <laughs> uh, Excellent. Virginia. Oh, great. <laughs> Virginia, how about yourself? Um, I would have to say joyful, inclusive, community, adaptive, and innovative. Brilliant, thank you. And Ruth, how about for North Anglia? Hmm. Caring, personal, vibrant, um, inclusive, and I would have to say ambitious. We want the very best, so really ambitious. Thank you, that's great. And I know you're very ambitious, so. <laughs> 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 and uh, how about for Malvin? Some of my words are hyphen, so I'm gonna count them as one word. Um, but it's really lovely to hear the other descriptive words because they resonate with me as well. So I have happy, 
Malvern College Preschool is holistic. It's very innovative. We have a vibrant family. There's the hyphen, vibrant family. And again, positive supportive. I've put that together because I think they, they are a, a, just a really special combination. So happy, holistic, innovative, vibrant family, positive supportive. Great, thank you. All great, amazing words to describe your schools. Um, so what is the greatest success story you can share with uh, about your school? And uh, it could be about a student, a teacher, developments at your school. Um, Jacqueline, can I go back to you? Anything that you could share with us? Well, look, Malvern College is 155 year. Um, it's got a wonderful reputation. And for me, doing um, opening the school in 2017 from the ground up, it was really important to get the mission, vision and values in place. We are true to Malvern College UK and that's really, really important. And in our first year when we opened, we were full with a wait list. So I think um, looking when we open from playgroup to pre-nursery to K1, K2, having that strong mission, vision and values to me is incredibly important. So to me, that was a big success. But I can't go uh, without saying that we offer a world leading forest beach school program. We're very, very special. We have, we're the only school in Hong Kong to be doing that. And we have our own level three forest beach school leader. We've got two forest beach school sites. So we do operate obviously through our campuses, but one day per fortnight, every pupil from pre-nursery K1 and K2 goes out to one of our two forest beach school sites with our level three forest beach school leader out into the great outdoors and our pupils are extending their learning within the EYFS bilingual environment to the great outdoors. And we take our parents, our carers along with us, and they are experiencing and learning about outdoor education. And we know with uh, our pupils living in Hong Kong, such an urban area, how important it is, especially with the situation in the world at the moment, with online learning, uh, thankfully coming to an end and school resuming, but we know the importance of well-being, of connecting back to nature and mm -hmm. taking our pupils back into the great outdoors is critical. So we're very proud to have the only school to be offering Forest Beach School. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I've had the pleasure to visit as well and it's absolutely beautiful. And, um, Thank you. I do, do, um, I do recommend that people go and visit that. that it's very stunning, very different, and very unique to Hong Kong. Um, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Howard, could I, could I ask you to answer the same question? Anything that you could share as a great success story for Wickham Abbey? Well, I think if you were ever going to choose a year to open a new school, you probably wouldn't have chosen this year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but here we are. And um, we've been closed down like everybody else uh, three times, once for social unrest and twice for um, COVID reasons. Um, the school is brand new. It was finished on time. We opened on the day we said we'd open. Uh, we had pupils coming in uh, on day one in full uniform. Everything worked. There were no snags on a four-story building. Um, we completed the outdoor sports area. Everything was finished on time. Um, the uh, two times we've uh, managed to reopen with the EDB's permission after each of the two COVID closures, uh, we've opened for full day teaching. We teach from eight o'clock in the morning through till five o'clock, um, providing lunches um, and everything else. So to do that um, in an opening year in such challenging times, um, we, we feel that's, um, that, that will count as a success. And the school is growing. Um, we're signing up, we're, I've got, I've, we're assessing children right now um, in, in the rooms just down the corridor. Uh, the school is growing very fast. We're, we're on the south side of Hong Kong Island, just outside Aberdeen, between Aberdeen and Pok Fulam. So almost the other end of Hong Kong from, uh, from Malvern. Uh, but but a, a lot of, uh, it's, it's a much quieter side of the island. It is beautiful. Um, and, and we seem to be in an area where there's a, a lot of up and coming families who are looking for a school without needing to travel across the harbor necessarily. Um, and so, yes, things are going very well. But I think opening and being a functioning viable school in this year is probably counts our biggest success. Yes, congratulations. Very, it must have been a headache, but a, a, a joyful headache, shall we say. I used to have a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look fabulous. Um, Virginia, how about yourself? Like Hong Kong Academy in Saikung, any kind of great success stories that you can share with us? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, this, this story really resonates with me and I think it really speaks to our mission. And um, this story is about a boy named Thomas. And Thomas was four years old and he was identified with learning differences. He had integrated support in his classroom. So he had an additional inclusion teacher who supported him within his classroom. And he learned side by side with his peers. And Thomas had many gifts. And one of them was the ability to play the piano. And a signature for us here at um, Hong Kong Academy is that our, in our primary school assemblies, we always have students play instruments to welcome the students and the faculty and the parents to the assembly. So now Thomas has been at the school for four years and he's been learning side by side with his peers. And at this particular assembly for grade two, he is meant to be playing the piano to welcome everyone into the assembly. And as the children come in and they get seated and the parents are seated and the faculty are seated, they are poised and waiting for Thomas to play the piano. Well, Thomas doesn't start to play the piano. And it's that awkward silence. And I'm wondering to myself, how long should I let this go on for? And I decided that I would wait and see how the students responded. And as long as they could wait, we could wait. And those students waited for almost four minutes. And then Thomas began to play. And after Thomas played, the students cheered and applauded and clapped for him. The teachers, the parents did the same. And when I asked the students at the end of the assembly as they were leaving, why they were able to wait so long, they said that they learned a long time ago that Thomas needs wait time. And I think it speaks to the individual pathways to excellence that we offer to our students, recognizing that students have different passions and interests, each of them being unique, and that there's truly a mutual benefit to being in a inclusive environment where we learn to be compassionate and discover each other's gifts. Thank you, Virginia. It was a lovely story to tell. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to add just now, because we've reconnected to Facebook, so I just wanted to quickly tell our viewers that we are live right now. So uh, today we are doing a um, virtual school panel for Hong Kong, and I've got four of our top, uh, top Hong Kong schools. Um, we've got uh, Harbour School, uh, sorry, Hong Kong Academy, North Anglia, Wickham Abbey and Malvin College. Um, and we've got the top educators from those schools. And we're just discussing early years education and getting to know some of our educators there and talking about early years education and the foundations and you know what's important to these schools specifically. So we're just gonna carry on with um, my last question, which was, um, which was talking about the great success stories. And I just wanted to ask Ruth Hansen from North Anglia, if she could share some a story with us, it could be about a student, a teacher, or any developments at the school, please. So, Tasha, I think um, for me, I always look at those kind of daily successes, even this morning, uh, welcoming, welcoming all the children into school. And I went to help one little boy into his classroom. I went to lead him to his classroom. And it was day two for this little boy. And he just turned to me and he went, it's okay. I know where I'm going. And that is a success for me. It's Every day you can point, you can always point to wonderful, outstanding achievements, academic, music, you know, a whole range of things that happen. Even like you say, the, this year that we've had, um, we can all really celebrate as, fam as families, as schools, how well we've done. Uh, but for me, um, it really matters every single day, every single interaction that you have with children matters. And therefore it's making sure that every day is successful for children, that every day they leave school or they think yes, or when they walk into school, they, they know that they're walking into their school. And, and that has to be a successful encounter every day with their friends, with the environment, with their teacher, it's their school. So for, for me today, that little boy walking in, and me not having to guide him and, you know, or say, you know, and gently settle him in. He just turned to me and confidently said, it's okay. I know where I'm going. So those little things, those little successes that I want children to have every day, that, that's what I look for each day. 
Thank you. It's a lovely story as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, let's move on. Let's look at panel shares and let's have a little bit of discussion. So I want to know, why do you enjoy working with this specific age group? It's a very tough age group. Um, we've had the kids at home for a very long time. So we know how tough it is with the homeschool learning. So why do you love working with these kids? Jacqueline from Alvin, could you, could you let us know? Well, for me, because uh, my role is in leadership and setting up world leading schools, and I've had the privilege of doing that uh, for 28 years with a focus on early years uh, campuses. For me, early childhood is such a critical time in the life of a child and it really sets the foundations for the future. Research shows that 90% of a child's brain or the brain is developed by the age of five. Thus, we're in a key and very important role to take on the support of the holistic learning. We need to be looking at the academic, the pastoral. We've got such an important role to play with the social, emotional, the creative, the physical, and developing that love of learning, which is so critical. We really uh, enjoy seeing the people learn and develop under our expert educators. I mean, it's such a rewarding profession. And we do certainly enjoy sharing the learning journey with our wonderful and supportive parents. So a really rewarding job. It's something, as Ruth said, you get those laughs every day. There's joys around the corner in every moment. And I couldn't think of a better profession, a better career, a better vocation. Uh, especially establishing early childhood schools and campuses uh, in the world. There's nothing I'd rather be doing. Oh, so lovely. You're a very brave woman. <laughs> <laughs> and Virginia, how about yourself? Yeah, I think for me, there's just um, so much discovery, exploration and inquiry. And to have that opportunity to see that through the eyes of a child. Um, and, and as they have this self-discovery and they make sense of their world and how it works and their role in it. Lovely. I, I couldn't agree more um, for most of the time. And, <laughs> and Ruth, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, exactly the same. They take you by surprise. Um, they are full of, you know, the young children, I think you see it at the very young age when you're asking for volunteers, they're all there. Yes. And you know, we'll help. We'll, I can answer that. Even if I can't answer it, I'll have a go. Um, they're always so willing to, to have a go. And it's a real privilege to, to work with children. They're incredibly rich and resourceful and incredibly capable. Um, and they just surprise you and also can be full of mischief, which I love as well. So it's a real privilege. I've always thought it's a very, I know this might sound strange, but it's a powerful role to be a teacher. Um, you have a lot of influence. Um, you can make, all, you know, you can make a child, you can, it, you can do, it could hinder and you can, you can help to support. Um, so it's a really powerful and with that comes a lot of responsibility as well. Um, and therefore it's always a really, um, a really important as a practitioner and early as practitioner, you always reflect on what you do and what you say and how you treat children. So I just love working with children. They surprise you um, and they look at things differently than maybe somebody of X amount of years do. So it's always good to look, through, look at something with fresh eyes through a child's eye. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and Howard, um, I know you don't work with earlier years, but six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, you know, within, to me, they're still of a young age. Yeah, what so, do you think? Well, I'm a career primary school teacher. I trained as a primary school teacher. Um, it's what I've always done. And the two previous schools where I was headmaster of in England uh, had early years facilities. So yes, I, I've been teaching those age groups um, for a long time. Um, I, I think child development is probably the thing that excites me, the energy of the children. Uh, you know, if any of us, and I'm sure everybody would agree on the panel, if any of us are feeling a little quiet in our offices, just get out, we just get out of our offices and go and visit a classroom. And, uh, you know, if you want to get energized, go and sit with 20, 25 children. Um, and I, I, but from a professional point of view, the fact that this age group from uh, children who are passing through early years and passing through certainly early primary, this is the greatest stage of development. Um, as Jacqueline says, the, the actual development of the potential of their, their ability to learn through their brain is pretty much there by the time they come to us. I think what we see is children working out what they're going to do with it. Um, they start as introspective, inward-looking infants who is just all about me, 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 who suddenly become aware of the world around them over the five or six years they're with us. And all of these aspects of their development, if you think of each child being represented by a little barcode 
on a can of baked beans or anything else you buy, you've got all those little black lines on that barcode. Uh, one represents sense of humor, one represents your shoe size, one represents your ability to see inference and all these other aspects. And all those little lines are developing at a different rate. And some of them just stick for a long time and do nothing. And you think this kid's never going to be able to play the trumpet. And then suddenly they've gone up to stage four because just like their shoe size doesn't grow on the graph diagonally, you know, their shoe, you don't buy a pair of shoes for six months and then suddenly you have to buy two pairs because they've suddenly banged through two sizes. So every other aspect, it's a series of long layoffs with a sudden sweep up. And it's those sudden sweep ups of ability to give the energy and the punch and the excitement to working with this age group. Thank you, Howard. I might invite you around to my house. There's plenty of energy there. If you'd like to come and babysit. <laughs> I've done, I've done that. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Thank you. That was really great to find out a lot more about your schools and the culture there and some, a little bit more of the insights there. Thank you. Now moving on, um, I wanted to just ask you about what you think makes a great early years teacher. And I will direct the question to Ruth. What, what do you think makes a great early years teacher? Uh, a great listener, uh, somebody who's very responsive, somebody who really likes children and understands them, somebody who cares deeply and wants to um, find out a little bit more, doesn't always take things at surface level. So a great listener, very responsive, very forgiving, um, full of energy um, and full of care. So and I always say that uh, you have to look at the child who stood right in front of you, right there and right now. It's great to know child development. It's great to have a wealth of curriculum behind you. But what really matters is when you can bring, when you know the child in front of you and you know them so well, they're your starting point and you bring that experience and knowledge together to really help that child to thrive and to grow. So. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Virginia, how about yourself? Yeah. I believe that a great early childhood teacher is someone who has the ability to be a great observer and the ability to wait, watch, and wonder alongside the child. You know, a teacher that holds your hand and your heart and guides you while taking care of both. Thank you. And Howard? Um, I, I would always recognize that this is a very specialized professional aspect of education. So um, I agree with everything that, that uh, both Ruth and Virginia have said, but, but I always seek expert training. Um, this is not the kind of world you wander into by mistake. Um, you know, I, I, I have interviewed several people in the past who've been considering career changes and come to me saying, you know, could I come to your school because I love children? Um, which is a great starting spot, but it's not actually enough of and by itself because it is an exhausting career. It's emotionally, um, as, as you were alluding to just now, it, you, you need to have a fitness, you need to have a capacity. You owe it to those children to be exactly the same person every day, all day, regardless of what's going on in your life. Um, and you don't just fall into that. You need to have been specifically and expertly trained and to be proven that you... Uh, have taken that training on board and you're able to apply it as well as being all those wonderful things that we know that uh, teachers of early years children are definitely i think you need a lot of energy is definitely need a lot of energy and um, it's a very tough job so well done i'm gonna say well done it is a very tough job so kudos to you definitely um and lastly jacqueline could you please um give, give us an idea of what you think makes a very a good early years teacher? Well, in my role as uh, leading over two campuses, it's one of the most, I think, critically important role that as a school leader you have, because you really need to hire only the best of the best. But what does that mean? What does best look like? For me, it's passion. Uh, I do really believe teaching is a vocation and I want those educators where there's nothing, nothing in the world they'd rather be doing than teaching. Um, at Malvern College Preschool, we do only hire the best of the best educators. But as my panelists have said, it's more than just having excellent qualifications. And all our staff do have excellent qualifications in early years. Most have masters. All my teaching assistants are qualified teachers. But it's about caring for each pupil and being an expert to differentiate for their individual needs. 
We want our educators to inspire, to engage, to support, to challenge, and to move each pupil onto their next step of, of their learning. We want teachers to make learning fun and engaging and really connect with our families as well. And we know when pupils feel safe and comfortable and supported with a love of learning, they can achieve at their optimal potential. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and then going on to creativity, I mean, it's very important in early years to have a lot of creativity. Um, they like to make mess. There's lots of chaos, there's lots of painting, there's drawing, play-doh, you, you name it. So how do you encourage creativity amongst early year students? Um, Virginia. Sure, I, th I think what's most critical here is providing that environment for them. And you want an environment that's full of wonder an opportunity for them, a place where they can explore and discover, take risk, and also interact with their peers so that there's an opportunity for sharing of the work that they're doing. Thank you. And Howard, how about yourself? I think creativity is something that's always in children. And I, I, I'm not an early years teacher, but um, uh, like Jacqueline, I, I've I sort of led enough early years teams to have observed these expert people at work and none of them ever tell children that they can't do something. Um, you can do anything but that doesn't mean you, you can be anything you want to be. You're going to have to try and you're going to have to try again and if you can't paint beautifully the first time we'll get another piece of paper and let's go again. Um, so it's, it's having, a, I think it's allowing children to experiment to try anything uh, but at the same time to um, to support that whole uh, wonderful exploration with resilience. So if it doesn't work the first time, it doesn't matter. We'll go again and, and it'll be better the next time. Um, because I think many children who don't succeed the first time get frustrated. And unless that particular critical point is managed well, uh, creativity can just be crushed for that particular little skill or aspect. So I think um, creativity with resilience Right. That's probably the key. Definitely. I have to come with you on that one. It's, it's great to encourage and drive the children to try harder. That's a really good attitude to have. Thank you. Um, and then moving on to Ruth, how about yourself? Um, I think it's really important that right from the onset, young children, our youngest children know that they're really valued, that they're really seen, that they have a voice and that voice matters. So again, going back to that great early years teacher, um, they have to make sure that that child feels seen. And then it's going back to making sure that the children know that they can express themselves in lots of different ways. They can express themselves with words, with movement, with drawings. So again, giving children lots of opportunities to express themselves. And we do in Nord Angler, we have our partnership with Juilliard. So yes, we're encouraging children to be creative musically and with dance and with drama and we do hold those things very dear because they're a form of ex expression and children need to know that they can express and what they have to think and what they have to say is important and it is valued even if you're just three years of uh, three three years old so for me it is very much about encouraging them like Howard said have a go have a go you know you can draw it you represent it you express it and you really value what that child then puts in front of you and another thing that's really close to my heart is possibilities. I want children to be able to look at something and think of possibilities. And I was really fortunate to work with uh, Professor Howard Gardner and uh, the late uh, Anna Craft, and we looked at creativity in young children and risk taking and the what if and I wonder. And it was really good to kind of how do you nurture that in children? Because even the young children will sometimes say, I don't know or I can't. So again, it's just right from that beginning, reminding them you can, you can. And when they're doing this, the slightest, the smallest thing, you value and you praise it um, and you build their confidence. And then they think, oh gosh, hold on, what I say and what I think does matter. And therefore you give them lots of avenues, be it music, creativity, art, dance, drama, mathematics, building construction, just make sure they have lots of opportunities to create and that creation is valued. Definitely, I also agree on that. It's, it's to do with praise, keeping their confidence going, keeping them, you know, just keep on, keep at it really. And definitely agree on, on you guys with, with those things as well. And um, Jacqueline, how about yourself? Well, I agree with all my panel colleagues. Really, we know from the World Economic Forum, creativity is a 21st century skill that is crucial now and for the future. At Melbourne College Preschool, our Reggio Emilia inspired learning environments are open plan 
and include messy and creative areas such as an art atelier, sand pit, dramatic play hut and more. I think with our engaging resources or tools for learning, we invite engagement and creativity. We believe through our EYFS curriculum by our bilingual, bilingual approach, we do really focus on teaching our children outcomes by an interactive and play-based approach, which is really the best way to harness critical and creative thinking. We really focus on encouraging our pupils to think out of the box, design, create, and use their imaginations. And again, with our very special Melbourne College Preschool Forest Beach School program, where children can be creative in the great outdoors. We have a science station where they mix and make magic potions. They build and design at the carpentry area. They erect a fort, a cubby, and they even design their own responses to our varied nature forest beach school projects. So lots of create, creative outlets and we really value it at Melbourne College Preschool. Brilliant, thank you. And yes, also agree, thinking outside the box is really, really important too. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch upon technology, if that's okay. I mean, nowadays, everybody's on an iPad, you know, there's a lot of screen time. So how do you feel about technology and the use of technology in, in a classroom? It doesn't have to be within, in early years, you know? Are we going into this trend of using technology a lot? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Howard, please, could you give me your viewpoint on that? Certainly. It's something we think about a lot. Um, clearly, we have a responsibility to our pupils to make sure that technologically they are advanced, that they're um, in 12 or so years' time, these children will be entering the workplace. Um, and they, 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 we know that technology advances so fast that the implements they're using now will soon be superseded by the time they're grown up. But it's the, the, uh, the attitude, the, the, the mental framework that they bring to technology that's going to ensure their success. But we also have responsibility to help children develop holistically and as, as a healthy human being. And staring at a screen all day is not conducive to good health. Uh, so typically in our, um, our online provision during the long periods of shutdown, uh, we, we unusually for Hong Kong, I think we, we did not use a Google. We were on a Microsoft uh, base using Teams and OneNote as the basic uh, combination. Uh, but we ensured that we did a lot of offline um, work as well. So our art department, we used one of our school buses to deliver art canvases, artwork, library books, um, models, a whole lot of STEM uh, things built of straws and paper and sticky glue and what have you, all kinds of things you have to load onto the bus without breaking them. Um, but all kinds, all kinds of work through the day, the curriculum for the online learning was designed very carefully to be a balance between online uh, screen time and off screen time. And the same is true in school. Every child here from the age of five has their own iPad. The iPad belongs to the school. We provide them. Uh, they stay in school. They don't go home. And so their time in school is usefully used, technically efficient, but it's not the main uh, source of education. I irritate my technical friends by saying an iPad is just a very clever piece of chalk. Um, and, and that's really what it is. It supports great learning, but it'll never do the learning for you. And it should be used in that kind of proportion. Um, so I think teaching children wisdom about technology, that this is just a clever aid, but it's not going to do it for you, is probably the underpinning uh, fundamental thing. And to get off your screen from time to time, we, we bought a brand new library of books. I didn't know you could buy a library when I opened the school. We bought a library. It's the coolest thing I've ever done. But we have thousands and thousands of books and there's not a screen in sight and the children just love it. And we got loads of chairs and seats and some of them are big stuffed pandas and giraffes and things. And uh, three or four of them will go and sit on the giraffe and read a book. You know, there's nothing, if you want children to read, if you want them to do other things, then give them other things to do and, and give them options and they soon find them. Brilliant, thank you so much, I totally agree. Uh, you can do anything online now, right? Apparently so, yeah. yeah. I, I bought the library online, I have to say. Yeah. Wow, well, there you go. And how about yourself, Virginia? You had a really good um, home learning uh, when we were doing homeschooling. It's very good, we, had, we did Facebook Live with you guys to learn about homeschooling and uh, you taught us Talk us through what you did with the onlining there, with the kind of like using the iPad. Um, what, what do you think in using technology within your schools? Do you think it's, it's a good thing or is it the trend? Yeah, I mean, I think we approach technology as a tool. 
just as a crayon is, just as a paintbrush is. And so if it has a meaningful purpose, then we're going to use it. You know, you mentioned our online um, program when we were learning off campus. And, you know, we really worked hard with our families to have a balance for our students. We're very fortunate. We, run, we do run from kindergarten up a one-to-one -one device program. So all of our students do have access to a, a device. However, we ensure that anytime they use it, it's really to enhance their learning and improve their learning, give them an opportunity to express themselves. One of the things that we built into our online program is that we made sure that they had two days a week that were low screen days. So we had a day where our co-curricular subjects offered uh, learning just for those subjects. So they spent an entire day doing visual arts, music, literacy information, uh, PE, movement. And so an entire day would be dedicated to that as well as an additional day where kids really pursued a personal project. So that was an opportunity to apply all this knowledge that they were learning through something we called HK Prime, which was personal relevant inquiry through meaningful engagements. And again, kids went out and did their own personal projects, uh, again, getting off of those screens. Excellent, thank you, sounds great. Might have to do another Facebook Live. It sounds amazing. <laughs> and then um, on to Ruth, could you share us a little bit about your perspective on technology? Again, it's a, a, t a wonderful tool. Um, it's exciting. I think that, you know, we're discovering more and more what we can do with technology. So, of course, you want to embrace um, technology in the classroom, in a child's learning environment as a wonderful tool. If you can do something more efficiently, um, more effectively, then yes, you can do that. And and I'm sure within you know, the schools where we have the VRC headset, headsets and when you're exploring the polar regions, you can kind of take children there. Wonderful opportunity. So, yes. Oh, sorry. So, yes, you can. You do need to embrace technology. There is a responsibility to make sure we're teaching children coding so they're not getting left behind in the world ahead of them. Um, but it's also powerful. It's another powerful tool in their hands. Um, and with our youngest children, we want them to be, to be very much involved in documenting their learning. And that's a great tool that we would use. So I remember the days when my children were in uh, early years and it, um, I was teaching uh, it was the paper journals and you'd be there sticking in the photographs and writing and now we have the wonderful online journals and we've moved to seesaw we've moved to seesaw for our year one's uh, children up through the primary and it's a wonderful tool in the hands of children to capture to document their learning process to give to receive feedback very immediate feedback but also to give their feedback and their praise so I think understanding technology understanding what it can do and being open to to it is very important we have the our partnership with mit again bringing together that creativity that understanding of technology to just see what you can do can you do something new can you do something innovative um, and that's what i want to bring into the classroom is what can you do again going back to possibility thinking and making sure we're keeping our children um, educated um, up to date if we want a better word doesn't matter if they're three four 16 17 we must make sure that we're really equipping them for their future future lives as well as their present so yeah i'm I'm happy with technology. Again, it's a wonderful tool. <laughs> Thank, and <I> do. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I have to say, I'm a strong advocate for Seesaw. I love Seesaw. Yeah. So yeah, really happy that you're using it. And uh, lastly, but not least, Jacqueline, could you share your, your kind of perspective on technology, please? I do concur with all my colleagues today. Uh, I think it, it does resonate. We really are living in a modern world and technology is a tool to enhance teaching and learning. And I think if you view technology in that light, how does the tool enhance teaching and learning? So you're really vetting and really thinking intentionally about the use of technology. But we definitely use it at Malvern College Preschool in a balance with other curriculum areas. We follow the early years foundation stage curriculum and technology is part of our curriculum. It's under the strand from the EYFS understanding the world so there's technology objectives we have to teach and assess. So it is an important part, but again, holistically balanced curriculum. We have the arts, we have PE, we have maths, we have literacy, but under understanding the world, the strand technology is there for pre-nursery, for K1 and K2. So we really do uh, facilitate those objectives by looking at world-class technology tools for teaching and learning. 
at Malvern College Preschool, we've got the bee bots, the little cute bee bots that the youngest children can program. And again, I think coding is really important. If we look at the statistics about coding, that even today there's not enough people in that profession uh, currently. So coding is going to be huge opportunity for our pupils moving into the world of the workplace. We do teach it at a ground level play-based approach in the preschool. Also, we have state-of-the-art interactive whiteboards. They really do enhance our teaching and learning objectives, but again, used in balance. We do have paper. We have, as Howard said, chalk, uh, paper, you know, all different modes and mediums of teaching, but it, it's one of our tools. We also have robotics in the preschool, simple robotics, simple tools, and teaching children about innovation and creativity using these tools is key with 21st century learning objectives in mind. Brilliant. Okay. So it's, it's all about innovation and keeping with the trend and in the know. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and I do love the bee box as well. It's excellent. Really, really good. And I should add, I forgot to add, we do have digital portfolios as well. So our parents are loving technology to share the learning journey, journey of their child. They can log in anytime and see the anecdotal notes, the videos, the photos, the descriptions, the objectives from the teacher and share in that learning partnership. And we could only do that with technology. Oh yeah, definitely. It's, and it's really good, good to, tool to have to see what your kids are doing at school and um, sharing the journey, as you, as you just said, thank you. Um, I'd like to bring the panel discussion to a close, um, but I'd like to ask you one more question, if that's okay. Um, I would like to know what your favorite child, child's book, children's book is, sorry, I can't get my words out today. Um, I personally love the G Julia Donaldson range, the, uh, the Gruffalo books and Room on a Broom, and I know my children read a lot of these at their school. Um, could you share with me some of your favorite children's books? Virginia, could you? Sure. Um, one of my favorite children's book is Because Amelia Smiled. I don't know if you can see it there, and I don't think it's hard to see, but Because Amelia Smiled by uh, David Ezra Stein. And what I love about that is that it doesn't matter how young you are or how small your gesture is for you to make a difference. So it's all about how Amelia smiled and because she smiled, that then had a roll on effect for people all around the world. Brilliant, thank you. And Ruth, how about yourself? Um, I love, and I tell the children this in lots of my assemblies, uh, giraffes can't dance. I love it. I love it. It starts off, he's willing, he's able, he then gets knocked down, but then somebody just says to him, you can, you can do it. And he starts dancing. I love dancing. <laughs> I do love to dance. I just love, it's a lovely rhythmic story. You think he's going to be downhearted, but then he, uh, he finds his music and he just lets go. And um, and I love it because, you know, children, you want to keep inspiring children. You want to kind of find the thing that's going to gonna ignite them and going to help them to realize that they've got something to give, that they've, you know. And um, so that's, I love that story, Giraffes Can't Dance. What, what's his name? I think it's... Gerald. Gerald, yeah. what's the old giraffe? I know it so well. I could, re I, I could recite it here. So Gerald, Gerald the giraffe. Yes, brilliant. But, <laughs> do the monkeys do the cha-cha-cha or something? The monkeys do, yeah. The samba, yeah. The, <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> And Howard, how about yourself? Well, as a, as a headmaster, probably, I think I've been a headmaster much longer than I was ever a teacher. I, I get the cool job. I get to be able to visit classes and read to them. Um, so really for different age groups, for the very little ones, I, I, I always uh, thoroughly enjoy we're going on a bear hunt. Um, we, we hardly ever get to the end because we spend so much time going swishy, wishy, wishy and, <laughs> and, and washy and whatever. Um, and and uh, lots of repetition, so that, that's always great fun. Uh, higher up, the, the, the wisdom and the, the very many layers of uh, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, children love to have the stories read to them, particularly year threes, uh, year fours, and it's only when they're older they realize sort of how many layers of wisdom there are below what appear to be quite simple stories. Uh, for year fours, I, I have to be very strategic with Charlotte's Web. I have to make sure the Easter holiday comes in time before I get to the sad bit, otherwise I disgrace myself in the classroom. Um, so so can, 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 can we sort of make it last so the holidays come before the end of the book? Um, and uh, for the older ones, um, good night, Mr. Tom, is, is always uh, for the year 11, 10, 11 year olds. Uh, a wonderful book, a warm book with some, some of the sort of, hints of the sort of more serious sides of life that, that children 
uh, start thinking about and some of the more moral um, aspects of life as, as well as being a great historical text. Lovely. I love going on a bear hunt and uh, Charlotte's Web is a classic. So thank you so much for sharing those. And um, lastly, Jacqueline, could you share us your favourite books? Look, as an early childhood leader, that's like asking a mum, pick your favourite son or, or child. I found I agonised over this question. Look, I love all books. And during school suspension, every week I would present a felt story uh, filmed online just to support the love of literature. So I think it's important for mummies and daddies to remember uh, you don't just have to read a book. You can convert it into a paper story, a felt story and or a told story, just retelling it with, with puppets or your imagination is really key. I would have to say though, after thinking, I, I love all the authors my, my panelists have said, but Eric Carle is my, I think one of my favorites, the very busy spider, the very lonely firefly. I think when I looked, he's an author and an illustrator and he uses preschool paints, the, just the acrylic paints we have in preschool and he collages his pictures, which, is very inspirational for the children because they see the paint at preschool is the paint Eric Carl used to illustrate his stories. He's, he's cut up the pictures, he's collaged, and I think that's really inspirational for the children to get motivated to be an author or an illustrator. I love the clear text, I love the simple messages. Uh, I know they're their favorite, and even if you read them again and again and again, and again, as children often love to do, they love that repetition and they enjoy reading um, his books over and over again. So also enjoyable for the reader, if you're a mummy or a daddy, to reread these books um, is, is, is enjoyable. Thank you. Well, you missed The Hungry Caterpillar. That's his most famous one, right? Well, look, I, I tried to shed mummies and daddies to look at his other books because that <laughs> is the famous one. And I do have the felt story for that one. Um, but the other ones, The Very Busy Spider is tactile, very good for sensory. And the very lonely firefly, you'll get a surprise on the very last page. I won't say what it is, okay. but it's it's a visual um, surprise. Okay, we'll have to try. We'll try that out in my household later on. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining. It was so so great to hear from all of you today and to learn more about your schools. And um, if anybody's got any questions, and please do send them our way. We will forward them onto the schools. And uh, thank you for joining, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Little Steps, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.